All right. Um, these are my conflict of interest, as Luba mentioned. I also am a consultant for Lavior, a company that makes um, creams for diabetic feet. Um, so today we're going to talk about treating type 2 diabetes, and I believe it is time for a change. So let's start with the beginning. Because this is a mixed crowd, we're going to, some things will be very basic, some things will be more sophisticated, but um, I wanted to even out. So fasting glucose, more than 126 equal to more than 126, is a diagnosis of diabetes. can also be diagnosed with a sugar of more than 200. can also be diagnosed with an A1C, which is your average blood sugar for the last three months of 6.5 or above. So if we look at the natural history of diabetes, which we did yesterday, we see that, where is the pointer? Let me see here. Okay. So this is what we call time zero. This is when the patient and the doctors wake up and say, oh, your sugar's going up. And this is sugar of 126. But if we look back in time, we see that there's a lot of metabolic derangement that's been going on for a few years. And we see that this is a relative beta cell function, which is a different way of saying insulin. And the, insulin, the beta cells have been working very, very hard, making a lot of insulin. Then they sort of work a little less hard. Make, and, and this is when we get the diagnosis. And we know this, for example, from a really nice paper from Ron Kahn from the Joslin, who we followed a very large cohort of patients that have, were at very high risk of developing type 2 diabetes because they had two parents with type 2 diabetes. So they follow them for an average, there's a 25-year follow-up study. And, we, and this is where we're getting the data from. Now let's start a little bit from the beginning. So what is insulin? Insulin is a hormone. And a hormone is just a protein that's acting as a messenger. And it's secreted from an organ, in this case, the beta cells in the pancreas. And this goes into the blood and it goes to a, re, a target cell. In the case of insulin, almost all cells are actually target cells. And it, when it binds to the receptor, the cell responds. And in the case of insulin, its main message is store and grow. So now insulin is secreted in response to food, and it helps us to partition the fuel. And now not all foods respond the same. So when we eat carbs, this is, of course, this famous a uh, slide that uh, I first saw from uh, Sarah Hallberg's talk, uh, the TED talk, that probably most of you have seen. And, and I think it's beautiful because it really, you can see when we eat carbs, woo, this requires a lot of insulin. When we eat protein, it also requires some insulin. But when we eat fat, whoa. This is, so this is like summarizing the whole t conference, you know, right here. So insulin, leads to glucose uptake in the muscle. So we know we eat, insulin gets released, and the first place, the biggest sink, most of, the, most of it goes into the muscle. It's used for energy. And this is an oversimplification, but after, from here, whatever is left over is stored as glycogen in the liver. Problem is, we don't have a lot of storage for glycogen. So then, whatever is left over is shipped out into the fat cells to be stored. Fat should be stored inside fat cells. And if they are inside fat cells, we're okay. When we don't have insulin, when we're not eating, things calm down, and now we start to use what we stored. We stored glycogen, now it gets released back into the circulation as glucose, and now the, the muscles have glucose to use, and same with the fat, releases this fat into the bloodstream, and we used it for energy. So we're really in, this, in a balance. Health is a balance between storing and using, storing and using. And this is driven by hormones. This is a hormonally driven balance. The problem is that we've sort of lost that balance because we are constantly in storage mode. Based on the food pyramid, based on the fact that we're eating every three hours, based on the fact that we're actually constantly eating. So we, th th this, remember, this actually requires a lot of insulin. This is storing, storing, storing. All right, so this storing, storing, storing led us here. Here we are. This is the United States. Israel is a little bit, not, not as bad, but we're not that far behind. So we really have to be, uh, you know, get out of the storage mode. So we were talking about this hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, and I just want to talk about this a little bit more in detail. So insulin resistance is a pathological condition in which cells 
fail to respond normally to the hormone insulin. So in the normal situation, the orange is the, is the glucose. It needs to get into the cell. It's a big molecule. It, can, can, it goes into the cell with the help of insulin. Insulin is kind of like the doorman, Choop, lets it in. So these are the, this is the insulin, and this is the insulin receptor. When the, this is the normal situation, and everything is working fine. What happens when we're always eating carbs or, or sugar is that, and by the way, carbs become glucose, which is, also needs insulin. Um, we, we're now, we, we ate all this sugar. Now, wh where's it going to go? It can't stay in the bloodstream. We, can, we have a very limited capacity to store glucose in our blood. And in order to get it in, I now need a lot of insulin to get it in. So, okay, all of the receptors are, are working hard. But the cell at some point says, hey, enough of that. I have way too much energy. I don't need any more. So now it down-regulates its receptors. Now it has less receptors, and those receptors have less affinity for the insulin. So this is a problem. But what's the response to that? The response to that is the hyperinsulinemia, because we cannot keep the sugar in the blood. It must be put somewhere else. And therefore, this is the insulin. We're now, this is the beginning of the whole problem. So what are the consequences? So I want to sort of focus on the fat cell, our friend. There, we, we saw uh, before the fact that we have little fat cells. Yes, we, we, we have mesenchymal cells that are uh, our precursors, and then they get converted and brought it in, and recruited uh, as the more we eat, and the more we need to store fat, the more we need to recruit new little fat cells. And as long as we can keep putting fat in a fat cell, all is fine. But actually, and this is actually uh, Ben Bickman um, clarified this for me recently, the, we are not able to continue to recruit new little fat cells in the presence of hyperinsulinemia. So what happens is that now, wait, I'll be back to this, that now our fat cells are limited and we keep storing and storing and storing, they become really big and angry. These fat cells become a source of inflammation. And you can see the difference, this is a microscope picture. So not only are they secreting cytokines that are causing a local inflammation, this soon becomes a systemic inflammation, which as you heard from Dr. Finney, Professor Finney, this is not a good thing. So these, these cells are also leaking out fat. They can't control it anymore. They, they can't hold it, and it starts to leak out fat. And they also uh, produce all sorts of hormones. So actually, fat is supposed to be stored in the subcutaneous tissue. It, it's supposed to be under your skin. But as, as we grow and grow, we start to put fat around the abdominal area. This is called visceral fat. And this fat starts to get angry and angrier. And in fact, we start to put fat in places where it really shouldn't be. For example, the liver, muscle, kidneys, pancreas, heart disease. Okay? And we start to see this, these organs start to malfunction when you put fat in these organs. So heard of fatty liver? Yeah? Okay, so here we go, fatty liver. Fat in the liver. There should not be fat in the liver. Glycogen, yes. Fat, no. This is a new disease we have in the last 50 years. Fat in the liver. So, fatty liver is made much worse by fructose, which I'm sure you're going to hear about in the next lecture. But this is uh, dr driving uh, the fat production. Now, like I said, when we, remember that we talked about the, the liver making fat to ship out to the fat cells. Issue is now, the fat cells are full. There's nowhere for the fat to go. So the fat just starts accumulating more and more in the liver. And it's being, under the presence of hyperinsulinemia, the glucose to fat conversion is actually really accelerated. So, and like I said, the fructose is making things worse. So this organ starts to malfunction. Now, now the sugar, instead of coming in under the presence of insulin, is staying in the blood. So what's going to happen? It can't stay in the blood. The pancreas is going to have to work really hard to push that sugar in because it can't stay in the blood. Same with the muscle. The muscle, it's got fat in it. It's got plenty of energy. It doesn't want any more energy. So, but, it, you know, the sugar is supposed to, it's the biggest thing for sugar. It's supposed to go into the muscle. But now it's not. 
it, must, it becomes less responsive to insulin. So here we are. So this whole big mess is called insulin resistance. Okay, this is where we are. One more time, because I like this. <laughs> okay, we are in insulin resistance mode. Okay, now, most people, most insulin resistance is, is present in about 70% of obese people are insulin resistant. So the thinner you are, you're more likely not to be insulin resistant, but as we get more and more obese, then the chances are quite high that you will be insulin resistant. But I think what's really surprising to me is that actually 25% of people that are normal weight are actually insulin resistant. So I think a lot of people don't understand that it's not just correlated with your weight. And this is a really important point, because as you heard throughout the conference, this is really correlated with cardiovascular disease. So what are the signs and symptoms? Signs and symptoms of insulin resistance. It's very simple. It's, it's the high triglycerides, more than 150. It's a low HDL in men less than 50, in, uh, in, in uh, men less than 40, in women less than 50. Hypertension, which is a systolic of more than 130 or diastolic more than 85. Weight gain, increase in waist circumferences when we start to, you know, the abdominal visceral fat playing its role. And it's very different for different races. For example, Asian people, they don't have a lot of fat cells. So they become insulin resistant at very low waistlines. And dysglycemia, which is a glucose equal to or greater than 100. So again, all of this is driven by high insulin levels. Now, I just want to talk about for a second about hypertension because um, it's, it's really a, quite a fascinating thing. I, I know uh, David talked about it also yesterday. Wow, you know, for, for like 20 years, I thought that hypertension was due to salt. So when I started running into this literature, for me, it was fascinating. Hypertension, let's take a look at, the, at this study. They took normal, uh, healthy young men or, and followed them uh, for, for four years. And they tested, they tested their, their fasting insulin level at the beginning of, of the trial. And what they saw is that those who had higher fasting insulins were much more likely to develop hypertension. Okay, so how could that be? Well, there are a lot of mechanisms that are actually acting here. One of them is that insulin causes reabsorption of sodium at the level of the kidney. We've, kn we've known this from many, many trials. And when sodium is reabsorbed, water is reabsorbed, and this causes volume expansion. Another thing is that fatty liver, in the process of converting glucose into fat, we increase our uric acid. And uric acid inhibits another molecule, which is nitric oxide, which is very key in uh, contraction and expansion of our uh, flexibility of our vessels. So, you know, that's what Viagra targets. We want to increase our nitric oxide. But the issue is that the, the metabolic syndrome decreases nitric oxide. And we talked about those fat cells that are very angry and are, are secreting all sorts of cytokines as well as hormones. One of those hormones is angiotensinogen. Again, a hormone that we target all the time with the blood pressure medications we give in diabetics. And another thing which really fascinated me is that high, the high insulin levels directly stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. Of course, I learned this from Gary. So the sympathetic nervous system is causing constriction of the vessels directly and increasing our pulse. Now, so many of my patients come in with high pulse and they never know why. And actually, the pulse gets better, which I find fascinating. So, okay. We have known that these risk factors for heart, these are the risk factors for heart disease. These are the main risk factors for heart disease, as Ivor just pointed out. And we have known this. Again, we have to bring Reven into the picture. He's, he's such an important player in this, because we have known this since 1988, and he was doing research on this for 20 years before that. Now, the, the conclusion of his, of his big speech in 1988, where he's, all these metabolic, this, metal, this syndrome, that he didn't have the name of metabolic syndrome yet, is saying is that really carbohydrates are making us sick because that's the obvious conclusion. The thing that most leads to an increase in insulin is carbs. So the next step should have been, well, let's decrease the carbs. But this is 1988. We're at the peak of the anti-fat movement. So we're living with this dichotomy, this contradiction in our head for all those years. 
Another issue is that insulin itself, just like was mentioned right now, it causes independently heart disease. It's involved directly. It's a storage hormone. It's an, it, it's, it, it leads to inflammation at the level of the blood vessel. It actually increases the foam cells. It increases the smooth muscle cells around, around the blood vessel. So it is independently associated with increasing cardiovascular disease, which I think is something that all of us who are prescribing insulin need to remember. So here we are in this cycle where we eat and the foods we eat are making us sick, making us insulin resistant, and these are the risk factors that eventually lead us to chronic disease. I'm focusing on cardiovascular disease, but wow, there's so many other diseases that are big players that, that are being affected by, by this situation. I just want to talk about one study of why we don't have high insulin levels, but there's so many, I had to take them out because it was making the lecture uh, way too long. But here's a study by Reven himself. 600 people, prospective study, 13 years. Healthy people, they measure their insulin levels and their insulin resistance, and they divided them into quartiles. Those with higher insulin levels had more coronary events. Okay, and this repeats itself over and over again. All right, so look, I'm still here. I haven't even talked about diabetes yet, okay? I haven't even mentioned it. So let's go back to our diagnosis. Diabetes more than 120, equal to or more than 126. Well, remember, dysglycemia is a sugar more than 100. So basically, diabetes is just a severe symptom of metabolic syndrome. End of story. That's it, okay? So how did this happen? Why does the pancreas now start to decrease its insulin production? Because of the same reason that everything else started to fail. The pancreas now has a lot of fat in it. Look at this situation where 30% of the pancreas in a patient with type 2 diabetes is filled with fat, with much less in people without diabetes. And as we know from the direct trial that you mentioned yesterday, we actually, when we are able to decrease the fat, the ectopic fat, the fat that shouldn't be there, we're able to reverse the diabetes. So take home message number one, okay? Diabetes is a severe symptom of metabolic syndrome. In order to treat it, we need to focus on treating the root cause, which is what? Insulin resistance. Instead of merely treating the glucose levels, which is what we've been focused on for so long, which is simply a symptom. So if somebody is sick with pneumonia, you're not going to give them neurofen. You're going to give them antibiotics. You need to treat the root cause. So how do we treat diabetes? Well, as I just said, we need to do two things. We need to decrease the glucose levels, the symptom, and we also need to decrease the insulin levels. Now, we have a lot of medications that decrease glucose levels. We have a plenty of things, a big armamentarium to play with. And um, this is kind of the fun of being an endocrinologist. You have uh, all these drugs to play with. <laughs> but um, what's the problem here? Some of them actually do so by increasing insulin. So maybe this is not the kind of drug I want to be using. So there's this big trial, the Accord trial, that puzzled me for a long time since it came out in 2008. And what happened here is they took more than 10,000 people, and it was a national, it was paid for by the government. It was a very in-depth study, and they, they took people with an average of A1C 7.9. And they said, okay, let's test the hypothesis that bringing sugars down to close to normal, meaning an A1C of 6%, is gonna be more beneficial than 7%. I mean, that was kind of obvious, right? I mean, we know the high sugar is not good for us. Of course, treating to 6% is gonna be better. Well, surprise to all of us. Well, actually the intensive arm, the group that was going for 6% died more, and they had to stop the study earlier. And there were many, many, People were puzzled. Nobody understood what the hell was going on here because we were, it was so against what we expected. We really, we knew from the type one community, a type one is a disease of too little insulin. And when you give insulin to these patients, you expect them to get better and they do. So we expected to see the same thing in type two, 
but lo and behold, we were totally confused. And there's so many editorials and what's going on and we don't understand anything. And I feel like I'm in Alice in Wonderland, this guy says. We don't understand what's going on. And this is from the diabetes care. And they, they thought maybe it's the hypoglycemia. And they said maybe these people are too old and we, they're too, they, were, they had too many heart disease risk already. And, and maybe um, it, there were many, they actually compared the insulin dose between the groups and also maybe it was the thiazolidine dions. Maybe, they looked at so many different parameters. But actually, 77% of these patients were on insulin and 55% of these patients were on insulin. And I wonder, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm, I wonder if, if anyone wants to, to, to comment on the fact that maybe it was just the insulin, because we know that insulin causes heart disease. So I wonder why we're not so, so just under, understanding that maybe the medications itself that we were using were leading to this problem. So I think what's interesting is that when we use, this was 2008, now we have more modern drugs, drugs that are, that are addressing the issue. They decrease insulin and they decrease glucose. So we see that, for example, the SGLT2s that have come to this conversation quite a bit, we see this is uh, empagliflozin, which is a medication that decreases sugar through the urine, decreases insulin, decreases sugar, improved mortality. Same thing with the GLP-1s, the, uh, the injections. Incre decrease insulin, decrease mortality. So it is when we decrease insulin, we decrease mortality. Well, let's decrease insulin by maybe taking away the thing that increased the insulin in the first place, and that would be the food, okay? Not the only thing, as you just pointed out, many things in do lead to in insulin increase, but I, the food is a major determinant. It's like, you know, the easiest thing to deal with. It's much harder to get rid of stress, okay? It's much easier to get rid of bread than stress. So here we are, we eat carbs, we get increased insulin and insulin resistance. We get all these, this metabolic syndrome and this is making us sick. Well, how about if we go the other way? Let's take out the carbs, decrease insulin levels, decrease insulin resistance, and this is a much faster and better way to health. So on that note, I will conclude that insulin resistance is present for many years before diagnosis of diabetes. Insulin resistance leads to many of the chronic diseases of our time. Diabetes is a severe symptom of insulin resistance. It's not a separate disease. We should redefine diabetes to be diagnosed when insulin levels start to rise, as we just heard thanks to Kraft's work. And the best way to treat diabetes is to decrease blood glucose levels while decreasing insulin levels. Removing carbs and sugars is the simplest way to treat the root cause of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. It's not so hard. On that note, thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs> I have a, a really <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I really am speaking. Well, thank you, guys. I don't know what to say. I'm very moved. All right, all right. Thank you very, very much. You can imagine what this support means for me. It's um, extremely moving. So anyway, I have, you know, clearly um, an amazing team working with me. My husband should be in this picture, but he doesn't quite make the picture. He's too tall. Um, we, we, we really built a great clinic. I think we have a lot of work to do. And um, anyway, thank you to all of you.